Oui, on n'entend rien sur Zoom pour le moment. Et voilà, tu nous entends Oui, c'est mieux, merci. Je vais faire une petite manip en fait. Bien, euh, ben, je pense qu'on va commencer, il est 11 heures et j'aime bien être à l'heure. Euh, voilà, donc euh, on a le plaisir d'avoir aujourd'hui euh, Jean-Paul Kneb euh, qui va nous parler de, de la cosmologie 3D en fait euh, à partir de, de enfin, let's start it in English, from uh, uh, Massive Optical Redshift Surveys, but before… Um, So I'm going to mute them. Okay. So mute everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Et Non, c'est bon, en fait, il faut changer vos réglages, en fait, les gars. <laughs> bon, ok. Uh, so, let's restart. So welcome, uh, Jean-Paul, and I will leave the floor to um, Henry, who is uh, kind enough to make a small introduction uh, to Jean-Paul before he starts his uh, presentation. Tout va bien? Tout va bien. Okay. <coughs> I'll make a very short introduction because I don't like these long introductions. Uh, Jean-Paul, <coughs> um, I guess you started out in Toulouse with a thesis with Bernard Faure a long time. You became a world-renowned expert, I would say, on mass modeling of clusters. And in recent years, your interests have more uh, tended towards larger ship surveys. You are very deeply involved in designing the, uh, uh, the selection function for DESI, amongst other large surveys. You're actually a uh, director of EPFL in uh, Geneva. Did I get that right? Lausanne. Lausanne. <laughs> Not you, can see why, you can see why my introductions are short. So I'll let uh, Jean-Paul uh, take over. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, uh, Henry. Thanks, everyone. And thanks also, Pierre, to invite me for the seminar. It's been a while. I haven't visited Paris because of COVID mostly. Um, so I'm very happy to be back here. So my presentation today would be about these 3D cosmology survey in which I'm involved and in which I'm trying to plan for the future. And of course, you know, why 3D is because when you look at the sky, you just see it in 2D with your eyes, but you have only, you know, part of the information. And what is really important is to have the third direction, what you measure with redshifts, and which then you can basically transform your image into a 3D structure. And, uh, you know, it's all, of course, it, a 2D project as part of the 3D, uh, but it really tells you all the structure, all the organization or our galaxy in the universe are distributed. And that's, that's what we want to do. And we want to do that, of course, because there's a lot of information when you do that. So that's what are gonna be my first, you know, 10 first minute would be why we are interested in, in doing this 3D cosmology. Then I explain a few of the project um, mostly I'll present some results from SDSS and also uh, one way that we've been looking into that uh, in my group, looking at uh, galaxy voids, okay, or the, the less dense part of the universe, we can say. And then I mentioned also what we're planning to, I mean, what we're working at EPFL in trying to develop what we call the astrobots, the robotics for fiber positioners, for the future redshift surveys. And I'll touch base about what are those redshift survey that coming in the coming years. So this is introduction is very basic and maybe it's more important for the student than the old folks. Um, but I just want to stress a few points. Our universe is governed by you know, general relativity. If you want to 
uh, you know, describe the growth of the universe and the structure inside, you have to put, you know, general relativity in perspective. And what is really important in general relativity is the link between the geometry of the universe and its content. Okay, and so we have the Einstein equation here that you can transform it into uh, the Freeman limit equations that tells you all the expansion of the universe, this Hubble uh, constant um, scale by each not the par Hubble parameter um, today depends, of course, on redshift, which is the time in, in, in space, but also on the different um, omega parameter that tells you how much radiation there is, how much matter there is, how much curvature there is, and maybe, you know, what is this dark energy component that we have to put in the system um, to, um, to make, to fit the data, basically. And let's see if this will be working. It doesn't work, probably because there's no sound. Tell Dr. Clifford, it's something he read. Yeah. The universe is expanding. The universe is expanding. Well, the universe is expanding. Well, the universe is expanding. Suddenly, it will break apart. Now, but maybe in the very beginning, what is that? Your business? Doing this homework. What? I really like that. Let me shut. Yes, because, you know, it tells, you know, that the, you know, the research we're doing is also affecting people. <laughs> um, and uh, here it's Woody Allen when he's kid and he's asking about, you know, what's the life and what we're doing here. Um, anyway, so back 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, we had the wonderful measurement of the CMB. Uh, so the relic of uh, uh, the relic emission of the light uh, very back from the beginning, and we see fluctuations. And these fluctuations in matter or in density propagate uh, through the universe. So that's very good because we have a method here that can tell us how things are propagated and what will be the, the um, the link between redshift and size. And that's what we are using when we do this cosmological survey. Uh, you know, we're trying to measure this bionic acoustic oscillation that you see in the CMB, but you can also measure that in uh, the galaxy distribution. So CMB was the first step in uh, precision cosmo cosmology. Then the second step was measuring uh, this distance relation, redshift distance relation with supernova that you know, points to an, an open uh, universe with a cosmological constant. Well, a closing universe with a flat universe, sorry, with a cosmological constant. Yes, yeah, sure. So I don't think you should say universe is flat. If the three dimensional section at the given time of the universe it is flat. Right. I'm saying that not because here, probably because it was what the meaning. Okay. So the general family said, but I was wrong. It was flat. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, you know, yes. And also I tell you the title by the way of your seminar should be for me. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Could you repeat the question for us listening online? Oh, yes. Nick, you can tell. Go. He wants to hear the question again. Oh, right. He didn't hear the question because he didn't raise the microphone. I didn't give him the microphone. Uh, okay. Shall we bring in the microphone or later? <laughs> I think it's better if. Uh, if the question is to my... Maybe just, just to continue. Oh, no, okay. Here's the question. 
they're just more, more, more common than the question, but anyway. Maybe you could just summarize the comment. I don't want to uh, distract too much from the Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I What I was saying that the universe is not flat because as you said at the beginning, that is filled with matter energy. So it's not flat. What is flat is a 3D space slice at a given cosmological time. And at a given time, but not every 3D slice will be flat. And I was saying that it is very misleading for the general public and also for some other physicists when you say the universe is flat. And then I said that your fantastic title should be 4D surveys because what you see is 4D, not 3D. But it's the light come, right? Which Thanks. is 3D. Anyway, so thank you for that clarification. <laughs> So what 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 you know what people when they look at the universe what they want to understand is you know these accelerated expansion and they want also to understand you know what's the origin of it um, is this this dark energy we're putting in or is this some modified gravity that we're still unable to measure or is it the geometry itself of the universe it may be different than the one we are, we are you know used to to do equation with. Um, so, at the moment, at least, I don't think there's a good and simple and new theory that answer this question, um, which is also good because that, you know, give us something to work on. And but the way you want to solve these, because you can always invent you know, new theories, is that you know you you need to get more data basically. And one of the data set. I mean, it's not the only data set you, you can uh, look at. It's the distribution of galaxies in the universe. What is important to understand is that the precision we have on the CMB measurement is typically at the level of 0.1%. The measurement we have been doing up to now with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey in particular, on the galaxy redshift distribution and on, on the correlation function and the BO measurement, it's typically of the order of one or two percent in the precision of the distances. So there's way here to increase your precision in your measurement. Okay, and, and the, the current limit right now is the stats, is, is the the statistical limit, so the number of galaxies. But of course, if you improve your statistic, you may find you know, new systematics. And basically that's gonna be the challenge of those new surveys. Right, so again, this is more for uh, new people. What's the cosmic web? So that's the distribution of the galaxy and the dark matter in the universe. Uh, you can see it in simulation. You can see it in the distribution of the galaxies. There's a strong correlation with the galaxy distribution and the, and the underlying dark matter distribution. Of course, this, the connection is biased in some way because you have more uh, galaxy in denser region than you have in, in, lower, dense, in lower density region. And we can define this large scale structure and we can also, and that will be some part of my presentation, what we call voids, those under dense region uh, where there's less galaxies and less dark matter. So what's the tool we're using? We're using spectroscopic survey. So we are taking first the image of the sky, and then we select some classes of targets. And for SDSS, and um, BOS and HEBOS, we've been using different class of targets, emission line galaxy, which are basically star forming galaxy with lots of emission lines. Usually you don't detect the continuum, but you just detect the emission lines and that give you the redshift. You have these luminous red galaxy for which you measure the continuum and you also measure the lines. You have also um, quasars, uh, from basically achieve 0.8 to 3, 3.5. You have these Lyman alpha quasars for which you measure the H1 clouds in front of the quasars 
And then you can look at the Lyman Alpha Forest and you can measure BO within the Lyman Alpha Forest. And we have also uh, for you know, the Sloan 4 uh, project, we had spider quasars and uh, time domain spectroscopic uh, quasars. So things that are fluctuating, fluctuating with time. So when you put all those targets together for each class of object, you can try to measure uh, the, this distance redshift relation using the BO feature. Um, here, when we did the, the EBOF survey, we introduced a new class of targets, what we call the emission line galaxy targets, uh, that were basically selected because they were blue in a given range of colors. And that allow us to basically push to higher redshift, basically up to redshift one, uh, the galaxy that were used uh, with, um, with Sloan. Uh, these same galaxies are now being used for DESI, and we're pushing things up to Redshift 1.6 also, uh, using the doublet, O2 doublet, uh, thanks to a higher resolution uh, in the spectroscopy, uh, in the spectrograph of DESI. So what, what we do when we have a, our galaxy catalog, what we're measuring is the clustering of those galaxies. And basically, the way you do that, you look at pairs of galaxies and you measure how many pairs you have as a function of radius. You can transform this correlation function into a power spectrum. And, and within I mean, the, that power spectrum, you can try to fit with theoretical models. What is really nice is power spectrum is something you can easily calculate uh, from theory. And, and, and basically, if you want to describe what you see in the power spectrum, you can put a lot of physics there. You can, you know, have, of course, the oscillation of the bionic uh, acoustic feature, and you see, you see that in the power spectrum, but you could also see at small scale the impact of the nature of dark matter, whether you have warm dark matter or, or cold dark matter. Um, you can also see the imprint of the mass of the neutrinos in you know, the power spectrum. Uh, on the very large case, very large scale, you look at the initial fluctuation, that is the non gaussianity of your power spectrum. So there's a lot of information in your power spectrum, and, and it's by measuring this power spectrum as a function of redshift, super precisely, so that means a lot of statistics. Uh, you, you can tell about this, you know, theoretical aspect. What you see in, in the small movie here is the 3D representation of the galaxy from the SDSS survey. So there's a 4 million data points here that give you the distribution of the galaxy in the universe, galaxy plus quasars. So the bionic acoustic oscillation we are measuring is a way to measure the distance redshift relation. Okay, what is the distance for a given redshift? This is coming from the very early universe. The CMB has this fluctuation imprinted uh, in the power spectrum. And basically this fluctuation, it's also what you can see in the galaxy distribution. You expect to see this feature this peak in the galaxy distribution in, in the clustering uh, measurement at roughly uh, 140 megaparsec. Okay. So that means big scale. You know, we, you're talking about you no know, order of degree scale. So that means you need to measure a very wide survey on the sky because the feature you want to measure it's on degree scale. So that means your survey needs to be like, you know, tens of square degrees or so. 10,000 square degrees. So the larger the survey, the better will be your measurement. You can measure these BO scale in two directions, projected on the sky, but also in redshift direction. Okay. And you expect also, just because the universe uh, is uh, a pretty not distorted, is that the measurement you measure, the measurement you have on the BO on the redshift scale and on 
angular scale should be the same value. Okay. The other important measurement you do when you do this galaxy redshift survey is the redshift space distortion. And this is measure you do at smaller scale, basically 50 megaparsec or smaller. And it's where you're sensitive to the um, local velocity of the galaxy, which are basically uh, sensitive on the distribution of matter, right? So the more matter you have, then you will flow of galaxy uh, velocity will be larger. So that means if you look at uh, um, over density of um, mass uh, of, of a structure, your redshift measurement will be squeezed, okay? Because galaxy tends to go to the center of the mass, okay? So you don't see the squeezing in angular scale, but you will see the squeezing in terms of redshift scale, okay? So you, your measurement in redshift will not be um, um, circular, it will be squeezed in the redshift direction. So that's the, the mineral panel here. If you are looking at an under-dense region, galaxy tends to go away from this under-dense region, and then you would have an elongation along the line of sight in the other direction. Okay, so, but that would mean you go, you're looking to even larger scale. And if you're in a cluster, then the velocity is really dominated by the internal velocity of the cluster, and, and you have this finger of gold effect. So that's kind of uh, looking at the 2D correlation function. So you have the circle that are unlighted in red, which is the BAO feature at 140 megaparsec or so. And at smaller scale, you have this squeezing of the redshift space distortion. Okay, so the, this squeezing tells you about all structure are growing due to the gravity in the universe. So it, now if you have these two components, the bionic acoustic oscillation and the redshift distortion, you can tell two things. You can tell about the expansion rate of the universe, and you can tell about the growth rate of the structure in the universe. Okay, and, and those two information are important and complementary. Um, and that basically are the base of these you know, redshift surveys. So what have been these redshift survey uh, from you know back in uh, 1930 or so when uh, Hubble first measure you know distances of galaxies? Well, there's been a number of them, uh, and the current one which just finished is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, with the last incarnation was uh, the EBOS survey. So the Sloan data altogether combined four million redshift measurements. And then we have a number of projects that have already started or will start very soon. So there's the DESI project that I will mention a bit more later, who basically aiming to measure about 35 to 40 million redshifts. Uh, we have PFS, we have Euclid, we have Foremost. Also, I'll, I'll give a, a point of view on that. And then there's a few new projects uh, that I'm, I will describe at the end which are really aiming to multiply by a factor of 10 or, or more the number of redshifts uh, to be measured. So let me just say a little bit on the Sloan Digital Survey and also the technology that was used to, to make uh, this happen. Uh, it's a fiber uh, optical uh, system, which basically bring the light of the galaxy or quasar you want to measure through a fiber and then redirect this light into spectrograph. And to do that, we use these maybe one meter size uh, aluminum plate. We were drilling holes and then there was people putting fibers into these holes. One plate is about 1,000 fibers, uh, 1,000 1, holes. Um, 80% of them were used for real measurements. So when you do the calculation after, you know, uh, 
18 years or so, you get effectively 4 million redshift measurement. If you want to do more, you need to change the technology because this, this is not really uh, scalable. What we get out of it, of the Sloan Digital Survey is uh, a collection of papers and measurements. And here we have the, you know, the full view of the universe where you see the sphere is the CMB. And then each point in, in this, within this sphere is the, uh, CM, uh, the, the SDSS measurement. We have different colors for different type of galaxies. And uh, on the left side, you have the BO measurement for each class of the galaxies. Okay, so at the top, you have the quasars. Um, and then going down, you have the, the low redshift galaxy, the ELRG, uh, at redshift of 0 0.2 also. Okay, uh, the blue one you see are corresponding to the ELG galaxies. So the measurement is not super, um, you know, super accurate, but uh, you can see the, the, the BAO feature. So if you put all that together, you know, what it tells you, well, it tells you that the universe is expanding of course, and it's basically following uh, the lambda CDM model of uh, derived by the, the CMB uh, measurement. So the, the points are basically points of BAO measurement. The curve are uh, the lambda CDM model of Planck. And you see that there's a very good agreement. I mean, uh, for the ELG measurement, which are uh, the lowest signal to noise measurement, uh, you know, we are within uh, the errors. Uh, slightly offset it, but nothing to worry because uh, that measurement was not very, uh, uh, very high signal to noise. If you put together the, those BAO measurement with uh, open lambda CD model of Planck, you really push uh, the confidence contour to something like a flat universe. Okay, so that's, you know, that was not something disfavored by Planck, but it's something which is even more favored uh, when you have a BO measurement. In terms of the growth of structure, what do we learn? Well, we learn again that this is consistent with a, a lam, a lambda CDM Planck model. But if you want to push a little bit more, well, you can you know, look at a WCDM model and then you see that the BAO is pushing you know, uh, towards something which is consistent with a W equal minus one. In terms of gravity models, it's also push things towards which is something which is consistent with general relativity. So it seems we, you know, we're not learning that much, but you know, we, we're still you know, making this lambda CD model like the, the favorite one for now. Um, if you look at things into a, more, a larger perspective, not just you know uh, the SDSS final measurement, but everything that has been measured before, we see that we have really from what we call the stage two, which was basically the earlier measurements to the stage three, uh, which is basically the completion of the, the SDSS measurement, you have a very good improvement into the precision of, of your parameter. So we can think, or we can believe that we can do even better with new uh, surveys. Um, and yeah, also maybe something I want to add here is that the, the BO measurement we're doing uh, is not really sensitive to, to the value of H naught. If you just take BAO, you're not sensitive to H naught, you're sensitive to the variation of the bell parameter. Okay, so if you want to say something about H naught, you have to combine BO measurement with other techniques. Okay, just a BO measurement will not tell you anything about H naught. What we're learning is the variation of the bell parameter, not the absolute value. So that's, that's our limitation. Okay, so all the measurements I've been uh, mentioning, I was using the two-point correlation function. 
of a pair of galaxies. Now, what I want to say a bit more is what can we learn or can we learn something more by looking at the underdense region in our universe? Okay, it's not obvious because, well, these underdense regions are also defined by the galaxy distribution. Okay, but what you may you know, capture is that those density regions are less well defined because you have less galaxies. Okay, so how can we put more, or can we, or can we extract more information of these under dense region? Okay, so that's that's the work I've been doing with uh, my group, is to look at those under dense region, and it's very difficult to have a very simple definition of voids. Okay, people are looking uh, sometimes as you know density level of galaxies. Um, or you know, number of galaxies. Yeah, I mean, there's different ways I mean, with sailing, with you know, how big is the region with uh, you know that density of galaxy. So we approach this problem with what we call the DT voids. The DT voids are defined by four galaxies. For any sample of four galaxies, you can define the sphere. Okay. A sphere with center of the sphere and the radius. And you have a unique sphere that you know capture four galaxies at any time. Okay, you take any distribution of four points, you can define a unique sphere with a center and a radius. So, okay, so that's how we define these voids. I mean, we could have it call it also spheres, okay? That would be also be another way to define them. Uh, but just because we're interested of the underdance region, we, we call it DT voids. But, okay, just, just make sure that um, you understand um, our, our, our definition here. Back in 2016, Kitara shows that uh, if you use DT void, you can measure BO um, feature in, in these voids. So let me explain a little bit more uh, what we do and what are those voids. Because in fact, depending on the selection of those four galaxies, you could have either under dense region or over dense region. Okay, and I think that's easy to, uh, to understand. Imagine four data four galaxy four points that are very close together so that means they will define a very small sphere okay and where do you find small spheres where you you find small sphere when you have a high density of galaxies okay so small spheres are basically defining not under dense region but over dense region now look at four points four galaxies for which you, the sphere that you know pass through each of these four points is big. Okay, those big spheres are basically defining these under dense region. Okay, so depending on the choice of the spheres you're using, you can either probe the uh, the over dense region or the under dense region. And of course, what is interesting here in our work is to look at the under dense region. So we're gonna focus more on these large spheres, right? Because you can always define these four points, define these spheres, and you can of course select the, the spheres of interest. Okay, so let's have the distribution of sphere and just focus on these large spheres and then see whether we can learn something on this distribution of this large sphere by looking at the correlation function of the center of the spheres. Okay, instead of looking at the correlation function of two galaxies, you look at the correlation function of the center of, of these spheres. And you focus on these big spheres, which are probing the under dense region. So if you do that, you can effectively show that you can measure BAO uh, and, and you basically improve BAO measurement by the order of 10%. That will depend, of course, on, on the, the sample of the object you're looking at. Uh, 
it's easier to do this measurement with uh, LRGs. Uh, we also had a recent paper measuring these uh, BO uh, with quasars, but because the quasars are very under dense, uh, the measurement is not uh, basically improving the, the BO measurement. Let's, let's still focus on this uh, um, BO measurement using the quasar sample. That's a recent paper we uh, published uh, this year. So we focus on this quasar between redshift 0.8 and 2.2. Mean redshift is about 1.5. There's measurement on the, the two caps. Um, we have about 350, uh, 350,000 quasars. Uh, and the density um, maybe doesn't tell you very much. It's 1.5, 10 to the minus five, um, but it's relatively low in terms of density of object. The top plot here is the quasar quasar correlation function. The bottom plot is the uh, quasar sphere correlation function. And you measure effectively, you have this bump um, in, in the quasar, um, in the quasar sphere or quasar void correlation function that, that you, you can measure. But it, you, you can show also that it doesn't really improve the, um, the measure, the BO measurement, but it's at least consistent with the, the BO measurement of quasar at uh, this redshift one point. Okay, so that's about, you know, current measurements. Um, let's see what's coming up. And what's coming up is basically the measurement that is being done with the DAISY survey. Um, maybe just, uh, oh, DAISY is working. Well, DAISY is working with this fiber position system, uh, in which I've been involved in the construction with the Berkeley Labs and, and University of Michigan. And basically these uh, um, robots, we call them robots also, are moving fibers on the focal plane, and they're basically replacing humans who put fibers into holes of, of this aluminum plate. Okay, and you have 5,000 of these robots, each of them moving a fiber. Here is only one tenth of the system. Uh, and you see it's, uh, it's quite messy. You have the robotic system in black at the beginning. You have then the plate uh, in black here. Behind you have some electronics and then you have lots of cables and the fiber optics uh, that goes up to the spectrograph. Uh, well, the plate is this um, shape here. And you basically have, you have uh, 10 of those and you basically merge them together. And that makes uh, this, you know, coverage of 5,000 robots. As of today, there's only 4,200 of these robots that are working, <laughs> but still, you know, it's better than 1,000. <laughs> and, um, because you can move them effectively and control them independently, it works well. The rate of failure of those robots is about one per week. So, you know, you can sustain a couple of years of survey. Um, but people are really thinking because of that, because of this failure risk uh, that may also increase in the future, that maybe we need to change the system um, when in a couple of years. That's just the view of the spectrograph. And it's only six of, out of the 10 spectrograph where you have three arms from the blue to the red. Um, and basically that's the field of view represented. And here it's just one spectra of one tiny galaxy. Um, and you have basically three arms. So blue arm, green arm and red arms basically covering from 3,600 angstrom to 9,500 angstrom. So you can measure, you know, lots of lines at low redshift. Uh, and if your redshift moves to redshift 1.6 or so, you can still uh, measure the, the O2 line. How long, how long does it take to reconfigure the plate? It's basically less than two minutes. Yes, 
everything moves in parallel. Uh, you basically do one move to precision about 100 micron, which is the size of a fiber. Then you have a camera that looks at each position of the robots, make some tiny correction. And usually after two or three correction, you're at five micron precision. Are, are, are the robots confined to a, a particular position like in Lamost? Or do you let them free, but then you risk uh, entangling the, the fibers? So you move the, the fiber to a galaxy position or quasar position. So it's always control, uh, except for some of the targets, you just want to target, you know, sky. So then you try to avoid, uh, you know, any bright object, basically. And in fact, when I say, you know, there's 4,200 fibers working, that is 4,200 fibers that are moving. We still are using the data from the 800s that are not working and as like a sky information, right? So it's not completely loss of information, but it's less, less interesting because we probably could do, you know, less sky observation than 800 uh, fibers. The failure. The question was, what's the main failure mode? The, the main failure mode is, is the motor. So you have two motors that move your robots. And um, we don't usually fully understand why the robots doesn't, um, I mean, the motor doesn't work anymore, but it's essentially the motors that's failing. Um, right at the beginning, well, before the observations, uh, we noticed that if you were pointing your robots uh, to the sky, it was not working. If you were pointing horizontally, it was working. And it was because there was some stuff in the motors that are affected by gravity, um, you know, pinions uh, that were not working anymore. Uh, so we could fix some of the motors, but probably not everything. And uh, the, the best understanding we have is that some pinions in the gear motors are moving and are not working when you look uh, toward the sky. But okay, for future, <laughs> it would be fixed because that would be something we tested uh, very, very fine. So DAISY in less than a year, because this started about uh, in January, 2021, I mean, the real survey uh, has collected more than 10 million redshift in basically one year. Okay, so basically more than two times what has been collected in 18 years before. So people are just working on the data. I think, you know, we, as a collaboration, uh, there are some plots, you know, going here and there, but, you know, it's still too early for me to show you anything. Uh, there's been a nice map um, showing that, you know, yes, we, we're collecting nice data. Uh, and this is working well. Uh, the most effective night was 140,000 redshift in a given night. Um, so that tells you that, you know, if the night is good, you <laughs> can effectively do a lot of measurements. Uh, and that's why, you know, we are moving quite uh, nicely. Uh, that's some plots that were produced uh, like a couple of weeks, mid-October 2022 with 14 million spectroscopy redshift. Uh, and that show you also the coverage. So the top part is the bright survey, um, which is basically done in bright uh, nights. Or, or, and the bottom plot is the, the dark slash gray survey, uh, which are basically looking to uh, you know, fainter galaxies. Uh, and you have the redshift distribution of what is measured. Uh, so in, in the bright galaxy survey, you may mostly focusing at galaxy at redshift 0.25 or so as a mean redshift. As for the dark survey, you go, uh, you quasars that are in green and you do a red galaxy, which I don't know why they are in blue. <laughs> 
I mean, the histogram is blue and, and the emission line galaxy, uh, which should be blue, but they are in red. Okay, don't ask me why they, they switch, switch the color, but uh, red galaxy in blue, uh, I mean, histogram in blue, emission line galaxy histogram in, in red. And you see, you go up to redshift 1.5, and then you have the, the, the quasars um, with the Lyman alpha uh, quasar above redshift 2. Uh, All together, you know, there's, as I say, 14 million. Uh, the, the, the bright galaxy survey, it's um, more than 6 million, and, and uh, the, the dark galaxy survey is about 7 million. So the, the survey will run for the next four years or so. Uh, and altogether, we're going to reach, you know, more, probably more than 40 million spectra. Redshift uh, at that time. There is also other surveys that are uh, getting ready. Foremost is the European uh, um, machine that will be installed on Vista. Uh, uh, the spectrograph have been finished. Uh, everything should be moving to the telescope uh, this year, or well, next year, uh, with the start of the survey in 2024. And it shows here more or less the, 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 the coverage of the uh, cosmology relative survey, which will only measure about 8 million redshifts, so much less than, than DAISY, uh, but much better, um, I mean, better than Sloan, and for the first time in the Southern Hemisphere, because at, at the moment, you know, on these two surveys, Sloan and, and DAISY, basically just are looking at the northern sky. Right, so this is will be very complementary, and I guess it will be also very complementary to Euclid. Uh, of course, Euclid will go to a higher redshift, 0.8 to 1.8 for uh, galaxies, and I like to to show this plot because you with Daisy, Euclid, and uh, and Formos, you have really uh, you know full sky redshift survey. Uh, of course, not completely homogeneous in terms of uh, coverage, in terms of redshift. But at least uh, over the full sky, uh, you will have very important measurement. So what's next after these three surveys? Well, this is uh, the Moore law for the redshift survey measurement, um, starting back in 1980, where we were measuring a couple of thousands redshifts. And uh, now we have a DAISY with 30 million redshift. Um, and if you, you know, push that line into your future. If you expect to wait until 2061 or so, you will have measure all redshift galaxy in the universe. Well, this is assuming if the models, uh, you know, uh, keep, uh, keep going the, the way it goes, um, which might be a bit challenging, but let's see. Why would you like to do more redshifts? Uh, well, basically, even with DAISY, you don't get the full information that you can measure, you have in the, in the power spectrum, okay? And that's basically what these plots want to tell. It gives the error on the power spectrum, delta P over P, as a function of a number of redshifts, okay? And the three points you have in ping, the dotted point, you know, in the, sorry, red, blue, and green, are the measurements that are expected with DAISY. Okay, so you, you see we are going to measure delta P over P at you know, 10 to the minus, uh, a few 10 to the minus two uh, with the DAISY survey. But if you really want uh, to, uh, to do better, and that's the lines, the lines tell you or you would improve your delta P over P measurement as a function of the number of objects you measure. Of course, this assume, you know, the physics you put on, on your power spectrum. Okay, if you put even more physics, um, which is for which, you know, would change slightly your power spectrum, then the, this plot doesn't work anymore. But with the current, you know, theory we have to define our power spectrum, it tells you, you know, where you should be going in terms of the number of redshift to measure 
to have a full understanding of your power spectrum. Okay, so, and that means basically you have to go at a few hundred millions redshift, so above 10 to the eight, to have the full characterization of the theory you have put in your power spectrum. So if you reach 1 billion, then you're good. You, you, you solve it all um, and, and you can stop doing redshift survey. Can you, can you just explain why the delta P over P is higher for a higher redshift? Well, uh, why it's, it's the, I guess it's linked to the information content you have in your power spectrum. Okay, so if you go to a higher redshift, uh, you have less information relatively um, because you don't have, you know, the full time uh, expansion of the universe. And that, that's my understanding of it. Yes, also, yeah. But that, that's basically the X axis, right? So there's a number of projects that are, um, that are coming, okay? And what I want to focus now, it's the last line here, this Megamapper must WST project. Because those projects are aiming to measure redshift in optical domain again, um, but they have to change things. You know, DESI is a four meter telescope, 5,000 fibers. So if you want to do more better than DESI, you have to have a machine which is better, which is probably a larger telescope and um, more multiplexing, so more fibers per telescope. Okay, and there's basically three projects that are in, uh, you know, in discussion uh, these days. Megamapper is a US um, project led by Berkeley. MUST is a Chinese project led by Tsinghua University. And here in Europe, we, we have this wide field spectroscopic telescope, WST, uh, which aims to be a 10, 12 meter telescope, um, which could, you know, uh, come after the ELT uh, and be based in maybe in Chile. Um, and, and all these telescopes, so they need to be bigger, but they need also to have a smaller or they have, need to have a larger multiplexing of fibers. And the typical number we're talking today is, is about 25,000. Okay, and if you just do the simple mass, if you have your focal plane, which is maybe 1.2, 1.3 meter diameter, and you want to put 25,000 fibers there, you need to have a robot, which is typically 6.2, 6.3 millimeter in size, which is typically two times smaller than, uh, than the DESI system. So the machine is, is one thing, then you have also the targets, you know, which galaxy you're gonna follow, right? Because if, you, know, you, you need to put your fibers on some galaxies and where you're gonna get the imaging data to, to select those, uh, those galaxies. So people are thinking, well, we'll have LSST, we'll have Euclid, we may have this Chinese uh, space station telescope. Um, and we want also to improve things, not just doing the same measurement in terms of redshift range. We want also to go to higher redshift. So that means also including uh, Lyman bright galaxy and Lyman alpha emitters into the sample of galaxy we want uh, to do. So that means also maybe we, we have to think about uh, you know, specific surveys to be able to identify these Lyman alpha emitters in particular. So maybe also doing imaging of the skies with narrow band or intermediate band uh, imaging. So people are already thinking about that. Uh, but you, you need to do that in, also in a big way because you want to do that full sky. So there's been you know, some white paper in the, in the US uh, Decathlon 2020. Um, that's the mega mapper concept. concept. It's 6.5 meter telescope. Um, that's the order of the budget, 140 million. Uh, if you start reusing, you know, most, a, a lot of the DAISY uh, infrastructure, uh, there's um, groundwork starting in China where they basically erase the top of a mountain and they're gonna start to build this uh, 6.5 meter facility. So things are, are, are moving. And basically that's these Megamapper and MUS project and WST, they're kind of 
follow the more plan I was showing before. Uh, and we basically gonna get, you know, 10 to the eight, couple of 10 to the eight um, redshift by 2035 or so. A little bit of word on WST, this is European project. Uh, the idea is to go to a larger telescope, maybe 12 meter, uh, very high multiplexing, but they want also to have at this, maybe at the center of the, the field of view, a wide high resolution integral field spectroscopy, uh, something like Muse, but bigger. Um, and that's basically the, the left plot tells you, you know, what will be the gain for these uh, IFU spectroscopy uh, with WST compared to uh, what exists with MUSE and blue MUSE in, in the near future. And that's some numbers where uh, in terms of richest space, you really want to gain in terms of the focus. Uh, you want to focus basically between redshift one and four uh, because it's also where your WZ measurement is, is changing the most. Uh, that's the the right plot, the left plot, sorry, and on the right is this uh, measurement of uh, accuracy in the distance redshift relation. And you see that with WST, but you could do the same plot with mega mapper and mesh. You really decrease by a factor of 10 in, in precision of this distance measurement. So you do that, and I, that would be the end of my presentation. Uh, it's talking too much. Um, is, is working on this fiber positioning concept. So these fiber positioners are basically mechanical system that move a fiber that's basically ended by my hand here. And you have two degree of freedom. And in this way, you can cover, you know, a, a, a circular or, or, or a, a donut shape. And you put them all together. And of course, one of the issue is that you don't want them to collide. Uh, so you don't want to have the fiber colliding. So you have to put that in the systems uh, to avoid colliding. You could change the size of the arms of the system. And then you could have a courage, which is either only one point for one uh, fibers, or you could have one point that could be uh, reached by you know, more than one um, fibers. And that will depend on the relative size of the, the arms of your mechanical system. At EPFL and with Berkeley, we've been working on different system. Um, the smallest uh, that we have for now is what we have the, the, the third one, the 5.5 millimeter positioner that was done with a company in Namik in Japan. I just show you know quickly those things. That's the smallest that exists. The problem of this one is, is too fragile. So we're probably not going to go with this technology because uh, you, know, you wouldn't do a good measurement. So we have currently a baseline concept, which we call the tree lamp concept, which came from Berkeley, or, but there's already some improvement on this concept. And, and the idea of this concept is also to put it in a, what we call a raft, so that you can have a kind of a plug and play raft that you can put on your telescope. So one raft would have 75 fibers or, or thereabout, and you put those raft into your focal plane, and you have like 250 of these raft. And the good thing of having this raft is that it's much easier to handle if you have only a couple hundred system rather than you know, 25,000 of them. Because otherwise it's just a nightmare to just to try to fix one of them. Okay, if there's a problem here, you remove one of the raft, you replace by another raft, and then you repair the raft. Okay, that's it. Um, Gary. So what a transition, uh, Jean-Paul, uh, from your earlier work, which was based on imaging, lensing, and you're the one who convinced me that uh, arclets are important and I did not listen to you well enough. And 
and you had a, a very important role in pushing uh, Euclid to move to the near infrared. And I think that's very important. Yes. So uh, thanks to you. And so now you're doing spectroscopy. So I have a question about BAO. <laughs> um, and I asked this question because I was playing in, with BAO, with quasars, with a, a young student called, I don't know if you know him, Johan Dubois. <laughs> yes. And we discovered the a small sign of BAO in the 2DF quasars until we found out that it was done previously with uh, SDSS quasars by a J uh, Japanese team published mm -hmm. publishing Yam Yamata, I think, yeah. in, um, in, in Path J. And their BAO and our BAO size scale was different from the Eisenstein scale. And, um, and in your plots, you see the same thing. So it's my first question. But in the second question, the, the, the emission line galaxies in one of your plots, you showed a plot with a lot of BAOs superposed. The emission line galaxies showed no signs of BAO, even though they had the same numbers. So they, I thought they might have seen it. This one? Oh, yes. Were, yeah. It's, it's, it's very small. Yeah. Okay, or barely there. Because indeed. in principle, the emission line galaxies don't know what's going on at 100 megaparsecs, so they should see the same thing. Yeah, but we, for, for the Sloan data, we are really limited by signal to noise. We don't have that many. If, if you look at the, I mean, you can all see it, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, the, the, well, it's not written, but you see the, there's not that many galaxies we've been able to collect. Mm -hmm. So we, could basically barely do a measurement, um, but if we were very limited by the number of galaxies we could take spectra from. And so do people agree now on the scale using different tracers? Yes. Yes. And what is it in the H minus one MPC? Yes. It's, yeah. a, it's the Eisenstein number 110 it's... or is it 95 like the Japanese found? <laughs> uh, I would need to look at the number. <laughs> but yeah, it's typically what you expect from Planck. Here. Jean-Paul, very, very impressive. Uh, um, you mentioned uh, very briefly uh, the radio uh, projects, I think yes. SK or the NGVLA. Could you expand on that? Yeah, I mean, SK, if you look at the, you know, the first white paper of SK was, you know, we're going to be the first machine that uh, measure 1 billion redshift. <laughs> that was one of the mo motivation of SK. Um, I, it's probably not something that will happen in the first, um, first, um, you know, first phase of SK, let's put it this way. Uh, it may happen in, in the future. What I think is super important, and that's, it, I think that was my nice side. Is, is, you know, even today with Meerkat, we're getting a very large number of radio galaxies. And if you look at the redshift distribution of these radio galaxies, you know, it's very different than, of course, than the optical. And that's, it's, I think it's where it's going to be super important. Typically, you know, the mean redshift of radio galaxy probably is more like redshift two. I mean, uh, it depends exactly on your selections. But as for optical galaxy, that's, it's extremely difficult to have your mean redshift. I'm saying the mean redshift of the optical galaxy to move to redshift two. I mean, in, in terms of density, it will always be so because your redshift distribution, whatever you do in optical, we basically peak at you know one point five or two, but uh, but more towards the lower redshift than the high redshift. Uh, in in radio, you can really push that to high redshift. So I think things will be super interesting and complementary. Okay, uh, thanks again, Jean Paul. It was a very interesting talk. So for you, then. The scientific motivation for doing all this is it to measure the value of W? I mean, what <laughs> happens if Euclid works really well? I mean, how do you sell making a telescope that large? Because most people don't care about what the value of W is. Yeah, I, I think uh, the way we try to motivate Mega Mapper and WC is not really measure W, but more measuring things like um, neutrino mass, uh, and also you know. Uh, Try to probe something on inflation, so looking at the the random field 
uh, on non-Gershon unity. You remember very well in the Euclid figure of merit, yeah. you can see that when you combine lensing and uh, clustering, you've got a very much stronger constraint than you would have yes. clustering on its own. But are you telling me that if you've got enough clustering, then uh, you don't care about the lensing or? <laughs> yes, to some extent, yes. Yeah, what a change. <laughs> Uh, do you have some other questions? Uh, ben was first. I mean, uh, you can always combine the two together, right? Yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, you, you mentioned voids, um, but uh, you missed an opportunity to highlight uh, how powerful voids uh, are, already are. Um, because on your plot, uh, when you showed the uh, vector space distortions um, and the uh, Akapuchinsky constraints that we currently have from Sloan, uh, those are now dominated by voids around uh, redshifts of around a half. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yes, you can, you know, they add fractionally in certain, just because the numbers of voids are not very large. So when you do cross you know, correlation uh, measures on large scales mm -hmm. and just use them as a point, as an additional point set, then they don't add that much. But, uh, but because of the particular properties of voids and the ability to model them, um, they actually already drive uh, constraints on the expansion history of the universe in the redshift, currently in the redshift range around, uh, let's say, yeah. 0.4 to 0.6. Yeah. No, uh, fair, fair so, comments. Oh, just yes. a quick question, quick uh, comment maybe on your uh, plot, which is very interesting on, on the um, convergence of the power spectrum yeah. as the as the number of objects go up, go, yeah. goes up. I mean, regardless of the details, there were some questions about the plots, but uh, but I so that plot shows how well you can measure the power spectrum, but that plot did not make, did not give evidence for your assertion that the power spectrum contains most of the cosmological information. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's also what you put in your power spectrum to some extent. Uh, thanks for the talk, yeah. I was also gonna say that, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I was interested by the um, fiber, the robot failures. Yes. Uh, so one of the big problems for DESI is, well, not problems for any of these kind of surveys when doing cosmology is fiber collisions is one of the main yes. systematics. How does having, so does the fiber collision rate change over time now? Because you have a lower density of fibers and is that, can you model that? That seems like a difficult problem. In in case of DESI, we, one of the good things is that you don't, observe one part of the sky just once. So you basically come five times at a given position. So this is mitigating some of the fiber collision problem, not everything, um, because particularly if you look at the you know, dense region where you have a high concentration of galaxy, you will ne never be able to, at least with only five pass, you will not be able to measure you know, the, the right uh, number of galaxies. So you always risk kind of, you know, um, say the number of galaxies you can measure in, in a dense region. But at least for say the low density region, the fact that you come five times, you remove this, this, uh, this effect. So the, the way people try to mimic that is to basically replicate um, with simulation uh, your survey. Okay, so you, you, you mock simulations and, and you, you have your mock data and basically you apply the same algorithm that you're applying with your you know, real data onto your simulation. And then you can you try to minimize the effect. So, so do those simulations now include robots breaking yes. over time? They do. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but it's a bit of a nightmare to to do those simulations. Um, do you know what happened with Lamost in the end? Can you tell us? Well, Lamost is not doing BAO survey. He's just uh, looking at uh, you know the our galaxy, and I think they're doing good. I mean, probably not as effective as they wanted at the beginning, but. Uh, and you don't have problems with the um, fibers heating up when they move, like in Lamost? No, 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 things are, are pretty working well. We just have these, you know, failures that we don't fully understand. But we, we can, you know, we can take advantage in the sense that, you know, that gives us, you know, better sky data. So <laughs> it's not completely lost. 
maybe one one uh, comment, uh, regardless of what I said about uh, the power spectrum and whether it contains all the information or not, but uh, even just about the power spectrum, obviously on large, when you do go into large scales, deep surveys, you know, light cones, um, you are you become more and more sensitive to the to the large scales where you are then dominated by uh, cosmic variants or by, uh, by sample variants. Uh, and in that regime, there are a number of quantities that you can measure um, where uh, if you you know where you can construct estimators that cancel sample variants and where you are ultimately limited by uh, Poisson noise. Mm -hmm. And so then you will always win by having more more objects. So mm -hmm. so. It, so, but these are these are quantities that have to do with yeah. the transfer, like with, um, like for example, uh, measurements of bias, which are important for mm -hmm. scale dependent, you know, scale dependent bias, for example, on large scales with primordial non Gaussianity. Yeah. Um, and so there are definitely targets of, of fundamental physical interest uh, that are limited by the number of objects. So if you're looking for uh, reasons or <laughs> for arguments to put in okay. your science case, this can be <laughs> okay. Maybe we should talk more about that. <laughs> Uh, any more questions? Is there any questions from people on the Zoom? I didn't see any, nobody raised their hands. Okay, then. Thank you very much, Jean Paul, for coming for Marcus. It's a nice talk. I'm glad that Euclid is launching next year. <laughs> yes. Désolé pour l'introduction. Non, non, mais c'est bon, c'est bon. Ah, we have to stop the recording. Allez, je vous en prie. Je suis là pour ce qui est... Je vais peut-être me donner ce qui est...